Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Uh, it's good to see all your faces this afternoon and to be here with you. Um, the song we're going to be singing is Great Is Thy Faithfulness. And, and, and a medley of other songs with the title of How Great God Is To Us.
is Bridger Still.
Mm. Yeah, we, 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 I've just signed you up to men's ministry. All right, so we're going to be on tour, all right? Amen. That was fabulous. And the elder who just sung, where's he gone? Where's he, where's he? Right. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, spoke the sentiments well. Um, less of us, more of God. If we only subscribe to that fully, we'd see a change. Now, for those of you who worried about the time, it's 10 to 1. You'd be pleased to know that whilst I've been up here watching the time, I've managed to shorten the sermon. Alright? So it'll only be 90 minutes now. More <laughs> than two and a half hours, alright? So sit sit tight. God, God's got something, got something for you. He's got something for you. Um, I've never been in a church where um, a fire alarm has gone off. And look, I got a bit worried, you know, when the fire alarm went off. Because the, 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 the young brother that was next to me, by the time the alarm started to sound, him gone. <laughs> right? So I thought, I'm showing my age now because he's gone in the car park, sit down and everything, right? And I was still on the, amen, amen. Devil, devil can't touch the church, right? We're gonna, we're gonna have church. And if we have to speak in the car park, we'll, we'll speak in the car park instead. I bring you greetings from the North England Conference. And um, I, I, I feel compelled to say this, that when you mention the North England Conference, there's kind of this big elephant in the corner, right? I'm, I'm gonna tell you, we went through a hard time as a church conference. You, you, know, you know about it, yeah? If anybody went to session and saw what happened at session, you'll know how hard it has been for the conference. But let me tell you this, I'm not too concerned about where our church has been. Because my Bible says that not even the gates of hell will prevail against the church. Yeah? So I'm not concerned about what men do. You ought to only be concerned about what God is asking you to do. Right? Just, 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 uh, just have this thought come into my head. Um, let me just work this out. Those of you who are Bible scholars, yeah? Um, hold on a second, let me just go again. How many times is Seventh-day Adventist mentioned in the Bible? Um, uh, Seventh Day Adventist Church in the Bible mentioned. Mm, 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 mm. All right. Mm. <laughs> you, you understand what I mean? After the, the, the testimony of Jesus, keep the commandments of God. That's what you subscribe to. I made that very clear. That's what we subscribe. It's the right church for the time we're living in. There's going to come a time when there ain't going to be no church. Those of you who are looking on, getting yourselves attached to some logo and 22 Zulu Road, you need to connect yourself to God. Amen. Yeah, the fire in London told you that. Amen. And I have to say also about the fire in London, we can't stop bad things happening. But we can save people before the bad things happen. I heard a very interesting discussion in the Sabbath school this morning. Um, Uh, let me go to the word. Let me go to the word. You'll, you'll pick it up through the word. This morning, I'm very qualified to speak on the subject that we're speaking about. It's Men's Ministry Day. Now, I believe you had a Women's Ministry Day last week, did you not? Did you have a good time? Wonderful time? Okay, so now we're going to have the proper week now this week? Yeah? Amen? No, I'm really joking. I'm really joking. Let me get, send you a message from Gu the Plunkett, who's the Women's Ministry um, Leader. Um, you're going to see more activities which are men's and women's ministry together. Mm. Women, you want to know how you get empowered to do what you want to do? You need to get the men on side. It's, it's, it's a bit like a woman who goes to the doctor or, or, or a psychologist and says, my, my husband's abusing me and, they, and he decides to work just with the woman. You need to work with the man as well as the woman. And so my message this morning is for men. <clears throat> Can we go to my slides? Yeah. My message is for men. This is, um, this is our men's ministry. It's called Men of Valor and Evangelism. 
And the anti-evangelism is very important, because that's who we are. And this ministry, I'm leaving it up there just shortly so you can see the, the Survey Monkey link at the bottom. We'll put it up again at the end of the service. But I need men to go to this survey, fill out the survey, to tell us more about who you are, what you do, what ministries you're in, what challenges there are in the church, so that as a conference, we can start to get an understanding as to who our men are. I have to say, God bless the women of our church. You know why? Had it not been for the God-fearing women of our church, many of our churches would have closed by now. Because the men have become sleeping on God. You didn't like that, did you? The men are sleeping on God. You see, we're going to talk about men of valor this morning. And as we talk about men of valor, you're going to discover that it is a man's responsibility to keep the church buoyant for God. Don't tell me that you're the priest of anything if you're asleep on God. And so what we see across the North England Conference, if I was to be, to be truthful with you, is a lot of churches where there are men attending church, but it's the women who are doing the work. Thank you, God. I didn't promise to tell you any fables this morning. I came to tell you the truth. You see, men like to occupy places and say they own things. But over time, they don't want to do the work to make the thing happen. I know that because when I talk to men's ministry leaders and they say to, they will constantly say to me, my church membership is say 200, of which there are 50 men, but only 10 come to the men's ministry meeting. So something is eternally wrong with our church currently where men are concerned. In some churches across the country, the ratio of men to women is six and eight to one. Eight women for every man in church. Are you telling me that God is not attractive to men? And so this morning we're going to expound and look at some reasons for that. Let's have my next slide. Oh, sorry, no, go back. Then. Sorry, this meeting here, this after this evening, seven o'clock at the Aston Newtown Church. Uh, we're meeting with men's ministry leaders. Those of you who may not be men's ministry leaders but have a, a, an interest in men's ministry, that's where we're meeting this evening for about an hour and a half to start to shape men's ministry in this area. I know there are many churches that only have a few men with men's ministry people occupying that space. And so we're going to be doing more area-wise, teaming men up together. The rest of 2017 will be a men's year of prayer. The rest of 2017 will be a men's year of prayer. Amen. But we want to show practical Christianity. So I don't care, no, no, I don't care. I'm not concerned as to whether you're 17 or 70. God has a place for you as a man of valor. Whether you're good with your hands or good with your mouth, God has a plan and a use for you as a man of valor. There is no text in the Bible that says that when you reach 60, you can stop working for God. There is no, no text in the Bible that says, I'm just 15, so I can't work for God. And so every man in the hearing of my voice, I am charging you this morning to become a man of valor. I'm, I'm, I'm coming to you. Because the word of God says that at the end of time, the standard of God must be we would be risen. When the evil one comes in like a flood, the Lord of hosts will lift up a standard against him. That's a man's responsibility to do. And so I'm not looking for men to do 
everything in church. Men have two responsibilities in church. One is that we need more men stepping up to the plate to do what God is asking them to do. That's one. But secondly, we need men who are prepared to make the, 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 the services and the environment conducive to worship. And so if you've got a, a, a woman in your church who's a preacher, let her preach. If you have a woman in your church who's a teacher, let her teach. If you have a woman in your church who ought to be an elder, let her be an elder. But you must create the environment for that to happen. That's your role. I better go to the sermon. That was just an intermission. So let's let's have a look. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Let's go forward. The making of a mighty man. The making of a mighty man. If somebody was to ask you, what is a man? What would you say? How would you? How, how would you? You probably can't talk back to me from here, but think in your mind if. If you had to think about what is a man, what would you say? Let's just go forward. What would you say? Yeah, next slide, please. What was this what came to your mind when you thought of a man? The greatest need, or the greatest, greatest want of the world, men not bought with a price. Men who recognize that they're here for a purpose. Not here by chance. You didn't arrive in Campbell Church just by chance. You are here for a purpose. Let's go forward. So let's, let's look at this. Thank you. Just pause now. What makes a man? Come on, then. we're talking about mighty men. We want some mighty men. In, in world terms, what makes a man? Well, you see, over time, we've come accustomed to define men in a very particular way. And the world has a lot to do with it. And so if I put some names up for you, would you recognize that this is how the world sees men? Let, let's go, let's have number one. Those of you who are a certain age, this is what a man looked like. Let's go again. These are, these are men, aren't they? These, these, are, these are tough. Hard, strong, courageous, valiant men. Let's go again. He said yes to that one, right? Let's go again. When we were at school, everybody wants to be Bruce Lee. Everybody. If you're going to be a man, pick Bruce Lee. The fact he was only five foot seven didn't matter. Yeah? Let's go again. Yeah, Clint Eastwood. Let's go again. Not surprised to have that one in, let's go again. Talking about strong, valiant men. For a lot of the British public, that's the definition of a man. And one more. So what we do know is that men are defined in a very particular way. And that for me, paints a bit of a problem for our church because the views and the opinions and the way that we, we paint pictures of men has found itself coming in, well not coming, it, it is present in our church. Let's go again. You see, there are some characteristics about men that we subscribe to. Let's go. Men are supposed to be tough. Nobody likes a weak man. Yeah? Nobody likes a weak man. I don't care who you are. Men are supposed to be tough. Let's go again. Men are supposed to stay in control. 
Women are allowed to throw things around and say, whoa, wait, wait. Mm -hmm. men, you have to stay in control, right? Let's go again. A man never cries. That's what the world says. A man never cries. Let's go again. Men are supposed to work through physical pain. Even if they, even if they, you know, I'm going to finish this thing today if it, if it kills me. Work through physical pain. Let's go again. Men are supposed to be providers for their family. And I think we have one more. Never back down from a fight. Over time, and there's a lot of American uh, studies on this, will say that men subscribe to this. And even though a man can be intelligent, his sense of not showing weakness causes isolation. And so if a man is having problems at home, the last thing he's going to do is to tell another man that he has problems at home. If a man is short on finances, the last thing he's going to say in this setting within church is that I'm short on finance. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Yeah. And that causes a problem. Because when I talk to men across the North England Conference, I'm discovering that on the outside, a lot of men look fine. And on the inside, they're broken and hurting and suffering. It may be because you came from a, a certain country and came here with dreams of what you would become and it never materialized. Maybe you got yourself involved in a relationship that you shouldn't have got involved in and now you're picking up the pieces for that. Maybe you got married to an upstanding Seventh-day Adventist woman and the whole thing has turned upside down. Maybe you don't have the finances that you should have. Maybe your whole life to people in church is nothing more than a pretense. And that's why when I go around churches, I repeatedly see men who are attending church and doing little to nothing. It's a problem. It's a problem that we have to face. Even on the very road that you're sitting, if you're sitting on the road with a man, he will have something that's causing him pain. And so this morning, I wanted to, to present to you an alternative agenda. This is all about purpose. Men were designed for a purpose. Who you are is for a purpose. And the only reason that we have difficulties with men in church is when men forget their purpose in life. What could God do with a unified group of men? What could God do if all of the men of Camp Hill Church were a unified unit for God? Well, let me show you. Let's go forward. Let me show you. And again. The mighty men of David. I don't know how many of you have ever read this section of the Bible found in 2 Samuel oh, yeah. chapter 23. Has anybody ever read this? Yeah. The mighty men of David. You see, the word of God in Romans 15, 4 and 6 says, Everything written long ago was written to teach us so that we would have confidence through the endurance and encouragement which the scripture gave us. 
then having the same goal, you will praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to tell you about David's mighty men of valor. The 37 of them are described. A captain general, three high captains, three lower captains, and 30 regulars. And here we have David rising from obscurity in and around a rural farm around the Bethlehem area, rising to become the most acclaimed king in the Bible. The big thing about David, men, is this. You see, you might want to think, David, man of valor, after all David did, David started well and ended well. Let me say that again to you. David started well and ended well. And despite his little bit of offshoot uh, uh, and, and, and waywardness in the middle, he ended well. Let's go forward. I want to show you these, these men. Valor. Yeah, we'll talk about the word valor. Look at the synonyms. Bravery, courage, fearlessness, courageousness, braveness, um, nerve, backbone, spine, manfulness, boldness, gallantry, daring, fortitude, metal. These were the mighty men of David, the men of valor. And I'm telling you this this morning because I'm hoping that somewhere in this description, somewhere in the accounts of the mighty men of David, some man, somewhere in the hearing of my voice, will get the inspiration to understand that if God is for him, I'm not concerned about where you've been. God isn't concerned about where you've been. God is only concerned with you understanding that if you're going to become a man of valor, it has to be with God. Don't tell me about you saying what. Don't tell me about any great man. These are the mightiest men that ever lived. Mm -hmm. let me, let's, let, let's, let's have a description. Let's have a description. You, you don't want to believe me. Let's go forward. Let's go forward. Here we go. These are the names of David's fighting men. Joseph Bashebeth from Takamon's family was leader of the three. So there were three captains underneath David. He used a spear to kill 800 men on one occasion. See, we talk about Samson all the time. These men would have put Samson to shame. Let's go again. Next in rank was Eleazar, another one of the three fighting men. Eleazar was with David at Pas Damin when the Philistines gathered there for battle. When the soldiers from Israel re retreated and disappeared, he attacked and killed Philistines until his hand got tired and stuck to his sword. So the Lord won an impressive victory on that day. The man killed to the point where you couldn't prize the sword off his hand. That's what valor does in the hand of God. Let's go forward again. Next in rank to him was Shammah, the son of Adi from Halar. The Philistines had gathered at Leni, Le Lehi, where there was a, a field of ripe lentils. When the troops fled from the Philistines, he stood in the middle of the field and defended it by killing Philistines. So the Lord won an impressive battle. Sorry, victory. Let's go forward again. Joab's brother, Abishai, was the leader of the 30. So now we have the three men. Now we're going down to 30 men underneath the three men. He was famous as the three and was honored more than they were. So he became their captain, but he didn't become a member of the three. Let's go forward. Benai, son of Jehoiada, was from Kabazil and was a brave man who did many things. He killed two distinguished soldiers from Moab. He also went into a pit and killed a lion on the day it snowed. And he killed a handsome Egyptian. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand. ben -Ai went to him with a club, grabbed the spear from him and killed him with it. He was as, as famous as the three fighting men. He was honored more than the 30, but he was not a member of the three. David put him in charge of his bodyguard. 
Mm. Let's go forward. There is a consistent thing in that message. There is a consistent message in those messages of valor. Did you pick it up? Did you pick it up? What was it? When God uses you for his, his glory, there is nothing anyone can do. This is the Ruach Spirit. The same Ruach Spirit that allowed David to pick up five stones when faced by Goliath and to run at the giant to kill him. When the Ruach Spirit entered David, things changed. And when the Ruach Spirit enters the, the, the men of valor that just described in, the, in that text, things have to happen. You see, the, the men of valor are concerned with the circumstance that they're in. Why? Because God was with them. And so you men who are facing issues in these modern times, you want to remember that if the Ruach Spirit is in you, if God is for you, if you are declaring yourself to be a man of valor, things have to change. Don't tell me what your employer is doing to you. Don't tell me about your lack of money. Don't tell me about how, how, how disabled you are, or how old you are, or how grey you are. Don't tell me about how disillusioned you are with the North England Conference. When the Ruach Spirit is in the man of God, things have to happen. And I'm calling for Ruach men this morning. What's great about the text we just read is that there is no mention of these men before and there's no mention of them after. What God is saying is that the making of a man, the making of a mighty man is all about him. It has nothing to do with the man. It's all about their connection with him. And sometimes when we're facing situations, we go through all manner of things to try and resolve them and never stop for a moment to understand that as a man of valor, I ought to be putting myself in union with God first. Psalms 1, one of my favorite texts says, blessed is the man that walketh what? Not in the counsel of the ungodly, no stands in the way of sins, but his delight is in the way of the Lord. And he needs Lord as he meditates day and night. He's positioned like a tree. God is putting you, men, where you ought to be and expecting you to bring back good fruit. Hmm. God has so much he wants to do with the men of this church. I know there are women here that are longing to see the men of God active for God. I know that. And God has placed this time in our hands for a purpose. He's expecting us to step forward for a purpose. Let's go forward. Let me try and conclude this. Amen. 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 All right. Are we jam? You see? Mighty men need rest. I know that. I know you can be active in, time, in, in church for, for a time and then you, you can become disillusioned with where church is at. We've been doing this for years and we haven't seen any result back from what we're doing. I understand that mighty men need rest. But the big question is who and where you choose to rest. 
You see, Samson chose to rest. But he put his head in the lap of the very one who wanted to kill him. And sometimes as men, we try to fool ourselves that our activity don't matter. Let's just go back one, please. Thank you. That our activities don't matter. But I know all over our churches, there are men resting close to the edge. Too close to the edge when God is asking them to stand up and to be men of valor. Can God really do what he says he can do? Can God do it? In these last days, is God going to stir up some men of valor in the Birmingham area? You see, when I, when I read, <laughs> when I read the men of valor and of David, I think to myself, wow, wow. You know, you know, David from his youthful days picks up five stones to kill Goliath. And so you're thinking, well, hold on a minute, so why five? If he was sure about his shot, why pick five? He only needed one. And then when you read through the word of God, you realize that Goliath had a father and three brothers mm -hmm. living in the area. Mm -hmm. And David simply said, if the five of them turn up, I'll take out all five. <laughs> That's the five stone story. It was not because he thought of missing. The Bible says that when he saw Goliath, and realized the audacity of what Goliath has said about God. He didn't walk up to him, he ran in his direction. And so I'm looking for men of God to stand up as, as, as men of valor who are not afraid to declare who God is. Maybe when you read the story of David, you say to yourself, I could never be a David. That's too high for me. I understand that. Maybe when you read about the three captains that he had, you think to yourself, I could never do that. That's, what, that's, that, that. that's too much for me, God. I understand that. Maybe when you read about the 30 men underneath them, you think to yourself, I'd like to be part of that, but I, I could never really attain that. And so let me tell you what First Chronicles has to say about that. In case you are not able to be a David, in case you're not able to be one of the 30, in case you can't be part of the, the 37 that was so highly acclaimed by the Bible, the Word of God has something for every single man who's listening this morning. Let's go forward. First Chronicles 12 says, these are the numbers of the men equipped for war. So below the 30, there were some men. And below those men were some men. I'm going to read it to you and you'll soon start to understand what I'm saying. The men joined David at Hebron to turn Saul's lead kingship over to David as the Lord, as who the Lord had said. From Judah's descendants, there were 6,800 men equipped for war. They carried shields and spears. From Simeon's descendants, there were 7,100 warriors. From Levi's descendants, there were 4,600 men, as well as Jehoiada. With him, there were 3,700 men. And Zadzadok, a young warrior from whose family came 22 officers. Mm. Let's go again. From Benjamin's descendants, there were 3,000 men. From Ephraim, 220,800 men. From Manasseh, 18,000 men. From Issachar, 200 leaders who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. From Zebulun, there were 50,000 experienced soldiers. They were equipped for battle with the Lord, with every kind of weapon. Their loyalty was unquestioned. Mm. Let's go again. From dead to life, 1,000. Uh, with them were 37,000 who fought with shields and spears. From Dan, 28,000 
600, Asher, 40,000. We go down, Manasseh, there were 120,000 soldiers ready to fight with all kinds of weapons. All of these soldiers who were prepared for battle came with a single purpose to head on, to make David king of all Israel. That's 340,000 warriors set up to declare who God is. So don't tell me that God doesn't have a place for our men of valor in these last days. If you can't be David, be part of the 340,000 that bring things to bear because the Lord of God has placed you in this place for that. That's the message I'm saying this morning. God is looking for men of valor who will stand up and be counting. Where are the men of valor in these last days? At a time when all things happening around us, where are the men of valor? This morning in Sabbath school, the brother was saying that we don't see him, we don't see him, we don't see him to be doing more than talking about the gospel. I remember a preacher, a, a member of the church, walked up to her and said, uh, it was a female preacher, she, she said, um, you know, Pastor, what we need in this church is a revival. And her reply was, I absolutely agree with you. Why don't you start it? And that's what I'm saying to the church this morning. It is nobody's responsibility to do the will of God but yours. Don't only look to the left and look to the right. Don't criticize, don't pick, don't find fault. Do what God is asking to you, for you to do. That's what we need in these last days. Men of valor who will stand up for God. Let's go forward. Let's go forward. Let's go forward. Let's go forward. And so it takes me in closing back to this point here. The greatest want of the world is the want of men. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. I don't know whether there's any men of valor who can answer that call this morning as my brother comes forward to, to sing for us an appeal. If God is stirring your heart, come and meet me here. We're going to pray that God will, will put his blessing on you. And so as my brother sings, if you want to be a man of valor, it doesn't matter where you've been or where you're coming from, how intelligent, how rich, poor, whatever you are. A father is rich in houses and land, holds the whole world in his hand, can do anything if you would only ask, dare to ask God for more. And so if God is speaking to you this morning, come forward.
you want else wants God to, to bless them at this time. The evil one doesn't want you to come. Because I'm telling you now, if men ever got fully wrapped up in the spirit and received what these men of valor received, the devil knows what that would mean. We stand on the word of God. Amen. As we watch what's going on all around the world, nothing can befall the children of God. This is the time to fortify yourselves in God. I can tell you this, and I'll be totally honest with you. <laughs> Since I took the men's ministry lead for the conference, I've had some heart, and my wife will bear me out. That's why the Apostle Paul, let me just read it to you. That's why the Apostle Paul, he, he, he says these things. He, he says these things. Where's my glasses? That's what mm, That's why the Apostle Paul says it, it puts it this way. So we're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside it looks like things are falling apart on us. On the inside where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. And so I want to thank you for coming forward. God sees it. God sees it. Don't let today just be a standing occasion. I want to be able to come back to Camp Hill and see men of valor standing for God. And then the end will come and you will see your master face to face. Let's just bow our heads. Lord God, we thank you for this award. We thank you for visiting us with your spirit. Lord, as your men have standed and, and have committed and given a commitment to becoming a man of valor, do for them what they need you to do. Well, some of these men are, are, are young and perhaps inexperienced. Some of these men are, are old men may be infirm. Some of these men uh, may be unemployed. They may have whatever difficulties within their lives. But Lord, help them to realize that there is still nothing too hard for our God. And so Lord, we, 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 we position these men to you. We give these men to you. Stir up men of valor in this capital church and the churches around us. Stir up men of valor who are not bought by any price but the blood of Jesus. Stir up men, that God, uh, men of valor, Lord, who see Jesus for who he is. May they continue to see you face to face and to be led to glory. May we be the head and not the tail. May we be salt and light to the world around us. And as men come in contact with men, with these men, may they see the, 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 the love of our Father and be led to glorify Him. And so, Lord, you know them by name. You know the very hairs on their faith, on, on, on their head. You know where they, they, they come and when they go. Lord, may they be blessed continually. May you enlarge their territory so they will do your will, Lord. Allow them, keep them resilient, keep them to be a man of valor, strong and faithful and bold and courageous and commanded by you. Because we ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.